This is a world of hidden mics and two-way mirrors. A world where nothing is private. I got some paperwork hand delivered to me. Harry Call is an expert. The best there is. Is that no about this? No, Dad's at work today. Let me tell you something about Harry Call. The best bar none. I'll drink to that. The best what? The best bugger on the West Coast. Excuse me, Mrs. Addison? Hey, go. I just want to give you this. Listen. You. <laughs> no, don't be scared. He can bug anybody, anytime, anywhere. Do you know that? Is it involved? No, 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 no. Nobody knows how you did it, though, Harry. It caused a hell of a scandal, too. Confirmed within the last two hours, Charlie Adelson's trial for murdering this man, FSU law professor Dan Markell, will now start on October 23rd. Does it involve me or other people? Well, probably the two of us. They're not people to him, just voices. He doesn't know them, and they don't know him. You probably have a general idea what I'm talking about. Uh, had nothing to do with me. I mean, I just turned in the tape. Who is the paperwork sent from? So, um, something that came hand to hand to me as I exited the building today. Hey, someone's messing with you, they're messing with me. Someone's messing with me, they're messing with you. Call them, find out who the fuck it is now. Trust me on this. Let me tell you something. I was a driver with Dr. and he told me the whole story. Be careful, Harry. Take it through. Find out who the fuck it is. That's all I'm asking you. I hope they find her. I don't know who you have to talk to, but it's, it needs to be nipped in the bud. You're an idiot. You gave a fucking wrong number. Get the fucking number and a fucking call because I'm going to call them. That's okay. Okay. I'm going to fucking go to the cops right now. Okay. Well, either you go to the cops or we go to the cops or exactly. we'll find out. What a stupid conversation. Stan, please. I'm trying to work. Call them. Find out who the fuck it is now. Trust me on this. I said, let me call you back later. What the hell are they talking about, for Christ's sake? Stanley, please, I'm trying to get this done. Why? Don't get excited. Well, I'm getting fed up. What's the matter, Harry? If there's one surefire rule that I have learned in this business is that I don't know anything about human nature. I don't know anything about curiosity. I don't, that's not part of what I do. There is nothing private about the conversation. Listen. Whatever it is, I'll, I'll take a look at the paperwork. That would be great. Perfect. All right. I'll talk to you later. Love you, honey. Bye. Love you. Bye. You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Hello, happy Saturday. That was from the great YouTube channel, one of my favorite YouTube channels, the Society page, doing the trailer for great movie, The Conversation. And I chose that not only because I love it and I love the society page, but because last time we were talking, we were talking about Donna and Wendy, their similarities, and Donna's latest filing, which I felt was filled with kind of secrecy, paranoia, worldview, very insular worldview. For example, she said someone came, a behavioral health official came up to me and was questioning me about my background. But I didn't know anything. I could, she didn't identify herself to me. And, uh, It's like she doesn't know who anyone is. 
who is everything is is everyone who they say they it, say they are who they are are all the phones tapped that's of course how she got picked up and i just did an episode with sunny tanner who was at charlie's trial and i was asking her why she felt that donna would make herself so vulnerable by saying all those things on a recorded call. And Sonny's answer is pretty interesting. So this is really a story of nothing is what it seems on the surface, including the PR. And today we're going to talk a little bit about these new PR filing, these new PR articles that have come up in the press and who's behind them. But before we do, I want to take a look at your comments. Lovely Sphinx says, it wasn't just divorce decree for Wendy. Wendy about to get disbarred and Dan was moving on with a new girlfriend and in love. Wendy couldn't handle seeing him happy and another woman around her boys. She was going to be disbarred, miserable, disowned lawyer, single mother, mom, while Dan happy in love progressing in his career. Yeah, absolutely. Right on for the right on. Sweet P0004 says at 118.30, this thing she's talking about, Wendy, she tells the truth that she is fine. Speaking for myself and others that I know, we were completely numb in shock upon learning of the death of an immediate family member. Perhaps more so when it's a young person who should have lived much longer. When my son died, it looked like I had a bad sunburn on my face from the salt in the tears burning my skin. In my opinion, Wendy looks and sounds like other known psychopaths in their police interrogations. I'm really sorry that happened to you, sweet pea. And I agree with you. She neither her breath is upset. So she's I think someone wrote a funny comment like, I can't with Wendy's and her panting or her heavy breathing, but she's trying to recreate, you know, that kind of and even upset breathing, but her voice is like full on. She seems very poised and in control of the police questioning. And she's questioning the detective and her victim's advocate just as much as they're questioning her. And my theory is that she's as long as she keeps questioning them, she doesn't have to answer questions and she's less vulnerable because everything in her mind, she keeps saying, I, I understand why you think I'm a suspect. I understand why you think I'm a suspect. Blue Falcon Crest 5632 says, what would you do if you were Wendy? Wait until you get arrested. Try to secretly escape. Wait for the trial since I'm a narcissist. I know I will win. It, it's hard to think like her, but I wonder, does she have a plan? Very interesting. And was her plan, was she supposed to meet? Was she supposed to hop on the next flight to Vietnam? Was the whole family going to commune in Vietnam? But I really think she thinks that she's not going to ever get indicted for this crime and ever have to go on trial. What I'm wondering about is Donna, why it's so sloppily planned. If, if, you know, we heard from a previous filing that Donna felt that Dan Markell was haunting her from the grave. Was the haunting and the feeling of getting caught any moment just too much to live with, that kind of stress? And she, I mean, is that just her just like throwing in the towel? Or did she think that she was really talking in code and she wouldn't get caught? I mean, 
we know that the, this family thinks that they are the smartest ones in the room. So hard to know. Miriam C. Kenna, 808 says, it is evident just how much Wendy hates Dan Markell, not because he was a bad husband or father. No, she hates Dan even today. Wendy couldn't stand that Dan stood out. Dan was more successful, more intelligent. I laugh at Donna saying she's living in inhum inhumane conditions. Really, Donna? Dan's body is six feet under. He is dead. Great point. And one of, I mean, that filing was so over the top outrageous with the dialogue as if Donna's imagining the people in the jail saying, we can't wait to violate these, fa we're, we're thrilled that we're violating this fancy woman's rights and bragging about it and laughing at her for being fancy, not rich. That's something different. She's fancy. So it's almost like she's giving herself a compliment. She's so narcissistic in her own imagination when she creates this dialogue that she can't just say like a rich stuck up B-I-T-C-H or something like that, right? So it's she's just fancy, very, she's complicated and fancy for the upper class people. But of course we know that this family is a family of new money. And speaking of, one of her claims was that she couldn't get water in the back of the van being transported from Miami jail to Leon County jail, where she is now. By the way, I was looking through the Leon County jail's like rule book. That jail is has more programs, beekeeping. I don't know if the women have that option, but beekeeping, GED programs. It really looks like, as far as jails go, one of the more sophisticated jails in the country. And not only that, but they have a YouTube channel and they did a little video on what it's like to, the, what the transport is like. So I thought we'd look at that together. So Donna said she was in the back of this van and she couldn't get water and she couldn't signal to get water. And of course she had to like fake some illness at a rest stop or something. On this week's Deputy on Duty, we explore the inner workings of how the Leon County Detention Facility manages inmate transports through the eyes of a longtime employee with a lot of insight. The vast majority of my career, uh, almost 16 years, was in uniform patrol. Well, you're doing everything from, you know, going to school to talk to some kids or, you know, helping a couple through, you know, a custodial dispute or working a death investigation. Deputy Daniel Smallridge is now approaching his seventh. So this is like one of the caliber of people that, doesn't he look like a person who would celebrate? These are the kind of people they hire to do these things who would not worry if the people he was transporting were okay, if they had water, he'd just throw them in the back of the van and let them dehydrate and almost die till they had to bring medical people on the scene. <laughs> so ridiculous. I know this is their own PR, but come on. 19th year with LCSO, and after years of working on the road, he wanted to explore something new without leaving the agency. Just wanted to change, and I talked to some guys up here in Judicial. They really enjoyed it, so I came up here in July of last year and then transitioned down here into the transport unit in about September. And I've been in transport since then. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it's a good group of guys that I work with. That support is crucial because the transport unit is a small, close-knit group with a major role in the judicial and criminal justice system. Generally, we are responsible for transporting inmates from the Leon County Detention Facility to the Leon County Courthouse for hearings. And while it sounds simple, inmate transport can sometimes get really complicated. The process requires a lot of coordination with confidential protocols to ensure the safety of everyone involved between all of the impacted locations. Making sure that they're secure, they're safe, they're here on time, we're bringing the right people. And then when it's our you know, time to take a trip, 
you know, it's our responsibility to put that trip together, find out where we need to go, when the drop needs to be made, um, when we need to get there, we're getting the right people. And so just putting it all, all together. The days normally start bright and early for the transport unit and sometimes last late into the night. There are some long 14, 15, 16 hour days um, on the road. And that means sometimes traveling the entire state of Florida and many times all across the country. We've also taken care of all of the extradition. So we go anywhere in the country as long as it's green lighted for us to go get an individual. We'll do that trip and it's generally a flight. Um, we've been everywhere from New York to Seattle. And that change of pace from working in uniform patrol to now is just the spark Small Ridge needed to pique his interest in something new. He wanted to make sure he had a long lasting career with the Leon County Sheriff's Office. Working on the road, um, I wasn't a part of a lot of trials. And so now um, being up here, it kind of opens your eyes to some of the inner workings of. So I, I, what, when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking that probably one of the things that Donna had was an emotional reaction to being thrown into what looks almost a little bit like a dog catcher's van you know, being locked up behind, and being transported in cuffs and shackles because these vans look like pretty much state of the art. Everything that I've seen in this jail look really new, really clean. Obviously, this is their own propaganda. I'd have to talk to someone who was in these jails. It's still jail. Don't get me wrong. But once again, I'm thinking how lucky Donna has it. And she doesn't even appreciate it. <laughs> you know, how the prosecution works versus the defense and um, angles they play, rules of litigation, things that can be talked about, things that can't be talked about. Um, someone says something and all of a sudden an attorney's jumping up declaring a mistrial. And it's just it's just fascinating. It's like it's like chess, you know, and it's uh, but I love it. Small Ridge's perspective is just one of the many opportunities available at the Leon County Sheriff's Office. You can learn more about the different positions and how to apply right now on our website, Leon County. So who wants to work at the Leon County Jail? GD program, you know, a million programs. I don't know if they're all active, but certainly a lot of resources are available to her. And that's one of the things that I know for my mother volunteering with people in jail that they get frustrated with is the limited resources in a small county jail compared to a bigger prison, state prison, say. But many of them feel, at least in Pennsylvania, where my mom volunteers, they prefer the jail because it's safer, easier to manage, and mostly what they're dealing with is boredom none of the really kind of dangerous situations that they see in state prison. So what we saw this week is, or in the past couple of weeks, is positive PR articles for the Adelson family. The first one we saw, this is, from Fancy Fiction's Twitter account was a op-ed by Dr. Benjamin Graber saying that this was all done by Sigfredo Garcia because he was jealous. It was like this really twisted story defending Donna, calling it a five-star family and all this stuff. And he has his own sorted past where he did not, he provided care to a 10-year-old and did not alert authorities that she may have been victim of some kind of a crime. And of course, he has written a book, is an expert on female orgasms. I mean, what a, what a background of this guy. And Fancy Fiction writes, Dr. Benjamin Graber has not had a close relationship with the Adelson family since the 1990s. Ben recently reached out to them. It's an effing shame the media is parading this goof around with credibility. Shame on them. But what was weirder, and actually, you know what? I can just give you a little bit more history on that.
This is from Florida Politics. Ben, ben Graber reconnects with the Adelson family after a long hiatus to field test nonsensical new defense theory. This is written by Peter Schwartz, and it's dated December 2nd. Graber never met Dan Markell. Let's set the record straight on the opinion piece authored by Ben Graber in the Tallahassee Democrat and quoted by the Miami Herald. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. Here's the background on who Ben Graber really is relative to the Adelson family. Authorities have named multiple members of the family as involved in the 2014 murder of FSU law professor Dan Markell, including Wendy, the victim's ex-wife, along with her brother Charlie, who was convicted of the murder in November, and her mother Donna, who was arrested while trying to flee to a non-extradition country about a week later. Graber represented himself as a friend of the Adelson family for 40 years. Not so. Graber had no personal contact with the Adelson family for decades, 25 plus years, prior to penning this misguided att attestation of their collective innocence. In fact, before Graber, Graber excuse me, reached out to Harvey last week to offer his, quote, assistance, unquote, he had to contact another person to get Harvey's number. Graver never met Dan Markell. He was not invited to Dan and Wendy's wedding. Graver was not in contact with any Adelson during the duration of Wendy's marriage. In other words, Graber was not a 40-year friend. Rather, he's a former friend who only days ago reconnected after a lengthy and politically complicated hiatus from contact. And it gets weirder from there. Graber's narrative about the true, quote unquote, motive for the murder, what he describes as a twist, excuse me, twisted love triangle between Charlie, Catherine McBanawa, convicted of her role as middleman in the conspiracy, and Sigfredo Garcia, convicted for shooting Markel, is a figment of Graeber's imagination and directly contradicts the sworn, albeit untenable, testimony of Charlie Adelson, the defendant himself. Charlie's defense was that he had been extorted by Garcia, who was motivated by the hopes of a 33... 300... 33... Thousand dollar payout. In Charlie's telling of the story, he paid Garcia and his accomplice Luis Rivera one hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars up front, out of fear for his life, and promised the remainder be paid out over time. A narrative that was swiftly swiftly dismissed by a twelve person jury. Graber's quote love triangle unquote story reads like the family's attempt to find or workshop an alternative defense for Donna, one that also fits around the irrefutable facts of the case, but is equally unfathomable. In Graber's story, Garcia was jealous of Katie's relationship with Charlie, so he set out to kill Charlie's sister's ex-husband in order to get Charlie pinned for the crime. There are multiple problems with this logic of the story. After Garcia shot Markel, he returned to Miami. And about two years passed, in which nothing really happened. Charlie remained in continual contact with Katie, and no attempts to frame the Adelson family were made. No gun was planted at Charlie's house, no messages were sent to pit law enforcement on his trail. Instead, the many participants in this crime carried on with their lives, happily it appears, until it became clear that the FBI was on to them. And even then, no efforts were made by Garcia 
or his accomplice to make Charlie take the fall for setting the murder into motion. It's unclear why Graber, a medical doctor and former lawmaker, would insert himself into this case with a storyline that on its face lacks reason and defies every other piece of evidence. For those in the back, it's unclear why Graber, a medical doctor, a former lawmaker, would insert himself into this case with a storyline that on its face lacks reason and defies every other piece of evidence. That alone should raise eyebrows about Graber's motives or mindset. Graber also failed to disclose various political relationships between himself and the Adelson family and other families with ties to this murder case. Harvey once served as treasurer for one of Graber's campaigns. Harvey had been supportive of the political career of his best friend, Peter Weinstein, a former excuse me, state senator turned chief judge in Broward County. Who else thinks that that is the same judge who helped get Charlie Adelson a degree from dental school? I'm, my hand is raised. Who is also Wendy's godfather? The Adelsons benefited significantly from their relationship with powerful people. And then in 1996, major discord between the families occurred. Graber ran for Congress against Weinstein and Robert Wexler in a crowded Democratic primary. Graber lost and proceeded to endorse Wexler over Weinstein, causing a major rift between all of the formerly friendly families involved. The Adelsons remain close with the Weinstein family, and these relationships were reinforced in the next generation. Charlie was a groomsman in Peter's son's Michael's wedding. And then Michael acted as Charlie's lawyer after Markel's murder, playing a role in advising the Adelsons and communicating messages from the family to Magbanawa, though through Garcia's attorney, Jim Lewis. These messages helped give Katie the confidence that the family wouldn't be talking with law enforcement and that she herself would be safe to stay quiet, which she did until her own conviction and life sentence in 2022. These aren't small details in the case, and Graber's exclusion of them is in itself curious at best. So the TLDR is simple. Graber isn't a Quote, 40-year-old friend and the Adelsons are clearly cooking up an alternative story fed through a useful hu idiot hungry for relevance to field test a defense for Donna that will fail as summarily as Charlie's did. So that is, I thought it was an excellent article. Again, in the floridapolitics.com written by Peter Schwartz. And that this is the kind of journalism we used to see nationally, really good kind of true crime reporting that really only still exists, in my opinion, in our smaller, more local press. So what Julie K. Brown, who I sat next to at the Ghislaine Maxwell trial in the overflow room, Did was take Graber's op-ed. Now, she made her bones, quote-unquote, breaking the story. She's been sued by her private eye that helped her write the book for Epstein. She's been sued by Epstein victims for misrepresenting their story. And she's been 
sued by someone close to Maxwell, if I'm remembering correctly. So there's a lot of lawsuits around her coverage of the Epstein Maxwell story. And I stood next to her getting into court. It was during the pandemic. So pretty much unless you bought a line sitter, had the money to buy a line that are willing to go out there at two in the morning and wait because there was such limited seating in court. Most everybody was in the overflow room. And I knew that day that Dr. Elizabeth Loftus, who was devastated in the Durst trial during Cross, she testified for Robert Durst. She's testified for Harvey Weinstein. She's worked on... Ted Bundy, always on the defense side. She is, she used to sit on as a advisor on the false memory syndrome foundation. She is one of the most beloved experts of the innocence project. She championed Tim Hennis's innocence before DNA was found. And she still isn't quite sure if he's guilty or not. Anyway, she was absolutely destroyed by John Lewin's cross in the Durst trial. And I knew one of the things he brought up was her 58 or 48, something in that ridiculous length resume. So as I'm waiting an hour to get into court, I introduce myself to Julie K. Brown. And I say, are you ready for Loftus's testimony? I wonder if we're going to hear about her And I'm sorry if I I don't remember the exact, let's just call it 48 page resume. And she kind of just was pretty cold to me, right? (laughs) And lo and behold, we're sitting in the overflow room and Loftus gets asked about her long resume and it being this ridiculous length of 48 pages. And at, at that time, Julie K. Brown shouts out, Oh, just gave us the cliff notes. <laughs> so the piece of information I just give her that she had no interest in, now she finds hilarious. It was just an odd, weird thing. I didn't, um, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't think, I, I didn't care for her. And I, and this kind of behavior that she's doing now, which is, you know, she's calling them a five-star family and just assuming that everything Graber wrote was fact. So why would someone in PR for the Adelson family, if that's what happened, let's just call it a thought experiment, go to Julie K. Brown is because she has supposedly on the surface, the lawsuits say something, you know, contend this, uh, you know, dispute this, that she's an advocate for victims and the underdog, which I'm sure the Adelson family likes to think they are. And she's throwing her hat in team Adelson writing a pro Adelson family (laughs) piece in the Miami Herald. I mean, what's going on here? So I tweeted, I'll just show you. Because I found it really revolting. So Maria Farmer, whose sister, Annie Farmer, testified. It's one of the strongest witnesses in the trial that I saw. The strongest witness I saw. She absolutely stood up to what was a very strong cross from this multi-million dollar legal team. Beautifully. She's so smart and eloquent. And is a, I feel, a big part of the reason that the government got a conviction in that case, wrote. And she, of course, was connected um, with Maria herself, was connected um, with the Epsteins and Maxwell's victimized by them as well. It's a nightmare to me that she covers this case, meaning Julie K. Brown. Of all the cases, she better not be cruel to Ruth Markell the way she was to we victims, meaning us Epstein-Maxwell victims. So I wrote under it, 
the victim must always be re-victimized. Re this golden rule of journalism must be taught in journalism school with a vomit emoji. What a freaking disgrace Brown is to support Donna Adelson's innocence fraud campaign. And right under that, Julie K. Brown <laughs> wrote, how? Because I wrote a profile about what a controlling mom she was? No, that's not it. So she's going to straw man and try to obscure what she really did in this article. Because I wrote about how she threatened to disown her son? No, that's not it, Julie K. Did you even read the story? Yes, I did. From beginning to end. This was a profile, not an analysis of a crime. So is a profile of Ben Graber's feelings? No, you took everything Ben Graber said and made it like it they were a it starts out saying that the family was a five-star family. Can I remind you, Julie Kay, that Charlie Adelson sentencing is coming up for conspiracy to commit murder and murder. So basically sort of the gist we were supposed to get from the article, what I got was that this family was too good of a family to ever get wrapped up in something like this. They had sure you conceded her personal problems, but so did Wendy on the stand. not an analysis of the crime, and it certainly did not show her being mother of the year. Yeah, but nobody's, she's not on, she's not going on trial for being mother of the year or not being mother of the year. She's going on trial for conspiracy to commit murder, and your article furthers the notion that it's likely that she wasn't involved. That's my issue. Why are these coming out? So, this is a technique when you have a strong case. This is what I think. This is my theory on it. When you have such a strong case against you, you and you have money, you can purchase these kind of PR campaigns. This is my opinion. I do not have any evidence of this, what went on behind the scenes. I couldn't know. And she's going to try to gaslight and exploit that and say, I just came at it from this angle. Actually, she just said she's not coming at it from any angle. <laughs> it's, it's not an analysis, then what is it? It's this case from a very weird pro-Donna angle. I think it's revolting. I don't know how they sleep at night, maybe on a pillow full of money. I don't know. But I, I was really disgusted, but not surprised. It was right in line with my impressions of her. Obviously, I didn't chat her up. <laughs> but yeah, it was right in line with my impressions of her at the trial. All right, I'm going to take a quickie break. When I get back, I'm going to revisit Wendy's amazing, 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 amazing police questioning. She's controlling the whole show. And it seems like she's got the whole police department, victims advocacy included under her thumb. Stay tuned. If you are enjoying this episode of my true crime report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. Oh, wow. Mary B. Sorry, I didn't get to this sooner. Thank you so much. What a generous super chat. When Wendy gave up Charlie in her police interview, do you think Donna was incensed? I think he own, the only way she would not be furious is if she thought Wendy's just naive and weak. Please comment. Thank you. You know, Mary B., that's interesting because I think most of the audience sees it your way. 
And of course, I'm of course going to have a kind of a minority opinion on this. I hope we can, I may be wrong. You may be right. The reason I thought she brought up the TV joke is because she knew it was going to get back to the police and their investigation. And what a better way to look innocent than to bring it up right off the bat. And I think if she really wanted to throw Charlie under the bus, she would have said that he looked into hiring a hitman. You know, she still denies that. That's throwing him under the bus. This is just a distasteful joke. She did put out that he could be, that they could have done it without her, but without a lot of proof. She already knows that probably people are going to be pointing to that. The divorce records are already public. All those filings are already public. She knows they're going to be looking at that and what a contentious divorce it is. So what better way to go into the police station and say, my husband gave me a lot of grief, but my family and I would never do this. We would never do this. But I think a kind of more interesting question is, What's the relationship with Wendy and Charlie now? They look like they're estranged. Although she said she talked to him last week. I don't know. Maybe on his birthday, I would think. But I don't think they're close. I think this destroyed everything. I mean, and, and not everything, meaning I do not mean to put this on the same level as Dan Markell's murder. Please do not misunderstand me but ruined everything for the life that this family knew. And I think that the how the family is going to communicate and what alliances, if any, are going to be formed between Donna and Charlie are very interesting to watch now. And of course, they're not supposed to communicate, but like we saw in that article that I just read, they seem to find a way to communicate through their lawyers. So I think that they're already starting a PR campaign to put doubt in the public's mind that maybe Donna wasn't involved. Maybe Wendy wasn't involved. And Charlie will just be the sacrificial lamb. But yes, I do think that this idea that Wendy is naive or that it was done for her, it was done as a present, meaning this ridiculous idea that the person who benefited from the most knew the least about it. Like that ever happens in real life. Come on. So, yeah, very interesting question. Thank you so much, Mary B. So last we left off, Wendy was with her sister woman sister we could be sisters we have the same skirt guys victims advocate we look alike don't our faces look alike and i mean it's almost like a seduction i mean i, I was like thinking that <laughs> through the whole thing she her the way she relates to people is so seductive even other women and, and the way the woman responded to her she's like well your eyes are much more beautiful than mine <laughs> what am I looking at here? And I think that she, this is a kind of woman being who she is that doesn't really have a sexuality. It's about what she can gain, what kind of power she can gain. So biological sex doesn't really matter to her. It's not a kind of sexuality. It's just how much leverage can she get? And we see these kind of really intense relationships like Tova Walsh, almost like a, a partnership with Wendy. And she's like hopelessly devoted to her. So the victim's advocate has just left the room. And he's sitting still like a statue. I thought I hit this up better. Lynn's office, and of course it's 
you know, she's a state worker at 4.30 on a Friday, so she wasn't there. I called, and not yet. I called Alan and Sergeant Baldwin, Joanna, sorry. And I spoke with um, his secretary. Isn't that interesting that she wants to know her name and that Donna was most concerned that she didn't know the behavioral health name and couldn't verify that she was a real behavioral health professional. What is the alternative? What did she think that she was like another inmate going around just asking about her medical history for fun in a very clinical way? Actually, I'm just practicing. I'm actually the guard. I'm just practicing because I'm taking uh, school at night just just let me practice on you these cl very clinical questions about your behavioral health history and your medications. So weird. He didn't answer his cell phone. I did get a hold of Jane. Okay. So she is on her way. Okay. And I'll keep trying. Alan, they were sending him a whatever message to his okay. phone. So he will probably call me. Did you tell Jane what happened? No, I told her. I didn't want to tell her over the phone. I said, I'm sorry, I'm being cryptic. Something's happened with her ex-husband and she needs you here and we need help picking up the kids and you're free to go with her when she gets here. We'll work on car seats. They may be done doing what they need to do with your van when she gets here. So y'all can take your car or we can get the car seats, however we need to do it. Okay. Okay. Do you want anything to drink or <laughs> I know that's probably the last thing on your mind, but um, anything to drink or snack or I know you were at lunch, but uh, just some water. Some water? Okay. okay, thank you. No problem. You got somebody? Yep, she's on her way. Okay, where is she going? She's coming. Interesting look, right? It almost looked like Wendy was going to have asked for a, an alcoholic glass of something there. And then she's like thinking it through and then she settles on water looking almost a little disappointed. This has to be high, high, high tension, high, high, high nerves. Here. Okay. And then I told her we would figure it out from there. She doesn't have car seats, so we need to work can you that get out. Couch, because he's uh, mm -hmm. doing the van. Okay. Uh, and they can uh, move the car seats over to. Yep. The other car and I didn't know if we'd be done or what, but we will get those. Yeah. Just a a comment about Donna and her complaint that she did a four or five hour trip without water. I'm old or older. When I grew up, we didn't have this fixation on hydration and water. People gave whole two hour speeches without water. They went all day without ever asking for a glass of water. Long car rides, everything. <laughs> Same thing with car seats. We had no car seats. Even asking us to put on seat belts, we we're like, what? Seat belt? <laughs> we played on concrete. It was a different world. I'm not saying it's preferable. I'm just saying that now this new way that we do things, it's like you can't survive a car trip without bottled water or something now. And I don't know how hot it is in the back of that van. I would assume it's air conditioned for being Florida. All right. This is, I'm trying to keep you informed as much as possible. Thank you. I'm trying to be in a bunch of places at once. Um, like your mother once said, you can't have your tuchus in two places at once. So <laughs> that's true. Do. That's true. Um, here's, I'm losing my mind over here. I, okay. This is the thing. All right. I'm, I'm my understanding. Okay. I'm going to give you. The so now we see we, Wendy, she started us out saying, I'm usually more entertaining. And now she's cracking jokes, telling stories. When you're really upset like this, you can't. You can't even go there. Your mind does not go there. And this is the kind of inappropriate behavior we saw from Amanda Knox, Jody Arias, yoga splits, saying inappropriate things. These Sociopaths, psychopaths, antisocial personalities can only fake it up to a certain point. They can't get, they can't get the, the emotions right. And they think that, that this is a normal behavior for hearing this kind of news. Regardless if she doesn't care, even if she hates Dan, it's still, he's still or was the father of her children. 
instead she's cracking jokes because she needs release from this high tension situation she's in. The, the, let me do it backwards because this would be this would be easier, or not backwards, but the other the other way. Um, Is he still alive? Clinically, he's not going to live. What does that mean? He, he's, he's, he has he a severe dead? yes, is a severe brain injury. It so much shot him in the head. It's it's apparently there's there's too much damage to recover from. It. Okay, that's why we need to get a whole. Now she's doing this seething thing where she's trying to emulate once again <laughs> this upset thing was this upset even breath, but you can't you can't do that unless you're really upset. So it just sounds like she's kind of like panting. It's odd. And she's screwing up her face, like grimacing. But I think that grimace is more in line. Uh, she just wants to get out of there. Get me out of here. Get me out of this high, high stress, high level, you know, where they could just arrest me any minute. And you know, once she left, she once she turned on her heels out of there, police got the call. Sorry, we're not going to, I have my clients, the Adelsons here, they're not going to be coming in. They're not going to be speaking with you anymore. We know it looks sus, but you can't say anything. Wendy already helped you out. See you later. Bye. Or of his, his family. Parents, right? I don't know what his like. It, I don't know if he has an advanced directive or right. what he would have wanted. He once told me that he would want all. We joked. I said I would want to be like, if I was ever. I have an advanced directive. I do this kind of work. I run a medical legal partnership. Like if I once said if I ever was like brain dead, I would want to be like. I'd want the plug pulled right. and he said he would want all efforts made like he would be cryogenically frozen like he wanted every single effort that could be made to keep him alive i know that much my understanding and that's what we'll have to get a hold of the family as soon as possible but my understanding is there's irreparable damage there's nothing that can be done i mean he's i don't i'm not there i wasn't there but I understand from from previous cases that the the brain his, his brain is damaged beyond repair. There's nothing that can be done for that. Is he so she knows that's not going to fly with the Markell family. And so, of course, it's something that makes her look better. I know for a fact that he'd want to still live, but of course, as long as he's still still slightly alive uh alive in that even in that way i think it would it would bring down the charges i would need to talk to a lawyer about this would it bring down the charges to attempted murder instead of murder if he were being kept alive by something like this for years and years and years and the expense of that or does she just want him kept alive for a little while till she can hightail it out of there and just get out of danger I don't know. I'm not sure what to think. Let me know what you think here. What what are we looking at? What I think is very interesting is that the victim's advocate is starting to mirror Wendy with her body language and, and sit sort of in alignment with her, not, not no longer across as a support, what can I do, but sitting like her, like I'm going through this. She's identifying with her totally. It worked. Whatever Wendy did worked. Is he still alive? Should I bring the kids to see him? No, no, no. He has severe facial injury. I'm, I'm sorry, and, and I know this is tough, but I would not want my children to see. Okay. Okay, I just thought I got this inkling that maybe he was like still somewhat conscious and I no. wanted him to get to be with them if that... Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry about that, but that's okay. that's, that's the way. The, that's the way. Craig Isom is like, "What are you talking about? You just put it together yourself." He was shot in the head, and you want you to bring in your kids? Are you crazy? 
And she's like, but I just thought I'm just trying to do the best thing. He's like, what? He's like, this is like where she's backtracking and pleading because she knows she messed up there. See, she doesn't care how much she traumatizes her kids as long as it makes her look good. And I mean, isn't that a theme in this case? It is. They, like I said, they okay. got severe, severe uh, injury trauma. Okay. All right. Is so, there someone like? Is there a doctor like working on him, or are they just? There, there's there's doctors at the trauma bay, the ER. I yeah. don't. I'm, I think he's been transferred to ICU. Okay. All right, and they'll have to make a determination about organs. Oh my God. And so forth. Oh. So, hence, hopefully we can. Uh, okay, the kids. Yeah, the kids. All right, now let's talk about the kids. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, Before we talk about the kids, let's talk about this kitchen sink drama acting, the soap opera acting. Oh, with the hand. So she's using her hands to cover her face a lot. She's using the tissues and the props. And I'm just so mesmerized by the victim's advocate. When Wendy looks down, she looks down. <laughs> just can't believe that that this worked on this victim's advocate. And this wasn't her first rodeo. I mean, she is young, but she had done this before. Your, I don't know who the contact person was. Was it one of the ladies that you were eating with? I think no, Miss McPherson. I thought I wasn't supposed to contact them, so I didn't ask about those two because I thought it seemed. Anyway, I, I asked fine. two other women I'm friends with. Okay, that are familiar with I the think children. Jane is who they got. Do they have? To, does the daycare place have to be contacted? Now the victim's advocate is answering Wendy's questions as if she were Wendy. I know you could argue she's just being helpful, but I just see this intense identification going on and almost like they have really become like twin sisters or sisters or a unit of force. It's like those two women talking, you know, as one to Craig Isom, the detective. So interesting to allow her to oh i i kind of thought i would go with her okay here's the thing all right as soon as this phone comes back yeah i have to ask you some questions about what's what's already i've already known about the phone yeah would it be possible for it would be weird for jane to like jane likes the boys a lot but it would be better for lynn to pick them up just because lynn has picked them up before like when danny had a back surgery okay. they're really they call her aunt Lindy. they're really close with her if we could get the cell phone her cell phone number okay um or lynn her and daughter, each other at all probably like, a little through me but they're not friends um uh, yeah i mean jane would be she's jane's a therapist like she'd be very comforting she has two kids of her own she'd be fine but I'm trying not to freak the kids out any more than necessary. So Lynn would, Lynn or Alan, her husband, Alan or Lynn would be the best choice. You don't have a number of my heart. Oh my law. So then Wendy's getting annoyed when, when the victim's advocate is suggesting something else. She's like, no, look, I'm running this show. You're helping me. You're here to assist me. You're here to back me up. And Wendy's going to, she's dictating how this show is going to run. It's absolutely crazy. Thank you, MK Villaverd. Cute. Is that a hamster? For the uh, super sticker. I appreciate it. Let me go chat with Joanna and see Please. where she got, if she got far with them. The, the reason being is you need to talk to me. Yes. Okay. And you've been you've been great. I mean, you understand exactly how we have to do things, and I haven't had to explain a lot of stuff, but really, I feel the need to. I I, I really want you here. Okay. If if you know, and and you're not under arrest or anything like that. I understand why you but think I, I'm but, the primary suspect. No, you're not the primary suspect. I have to work. She's like, darn it, I'm going to continue to have to answer questions. I thought I had smooth sailing from now on out. 
but now I'm going to have to sit here and answer more questions. You know how excruciating this must have been? Not for the reasons that most feeling people who would experience this would feel, but just because she's so worried that she's going to end in arrest. I wonder what else she planned for, her, if she had planned to get detained or arrested or questioned. I think she had to know that mostly when they're just still establishing facts that she did have a little window to talk to them and then get out of there on her own free will. I mean, she could walk out the door any day, but he's telling you you've been great, but we just need you here a little longer. And she's like, uh, she really thought she could get the kids, get her family and they'd all go down to Miami together. Just as hard, whether you were or you're not. Okay, okay I understand. To, to show what your activities were. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and let's put it this way. I think you're a straightforward person. And I think at this point. It- well, that was a mistake right there. I think even he would regret thinking that and saying that. She must be pretty convincing in person. We're looking at this with hindsight. You know, if Craig had been on to Wendy from the beginning and really harsh with her and and arrested her on the spot and indicted her and they didn't have enough evidence to, you know, go forward with a conviction right there, you know, you would hear the innocence crowd screaming about it. This is what's wrong with our police force, our detective force, jumping to conclusions, tunnel vision investigation. I mean, he really can't win. But at the same time, it's hard to watch this and hear, listen to him complimenting her and, and patting her on the back and, and treating her with kit gloves. It's hard to listen to. I just know how difficult this job is and how little appreciation they get and how much criticism our police force gets from people who don't have the guts to do the job themselves. If you had anything to do with this, you'd have already told me. Okay. And you haven't. So, so my, my thing is, is that let's let the... My ex-husband caused me a lot of grief. <laughs> I would never do something like this. I know. <laughs> and and it's gonna, so I understand why I okay. would be the person you would think would do something. But well, we have to work just as hard to eliminate. It's people. fine. I want to figure out who this is because right. I I'm honestly worried. Well, let me ask you: if you found out that this was someone that you personally know, it. wait, did you guys hear that? She said, "I want to figure out who this is because," and then she trails off. Did anyone hear what she said? I want to figure. Someone that you know personally. Let me see if I can go back and hear what she says. Figure out who this is because why. Well, let me ask you. If you found out. Does anyone know what she said? Hold on. I'm just going to look at the chat for a second. Did anyone hear what she said? Why she wanted to figure out? No, right? Yeah, I mean, because it seems to me like she started the sentencing, the sentence, the sentencing, excuse me, Freudian slip there, the sentence out saying, I want to figure out who this is because, and I don't know if she was going to say it's the father of my children or I I love this man at one time. I don't know where she was going with it. And I don't think she, and when she got to it, she didn't know what the right emotions were to attach to it. So she's kind of just like trails off. That's what I heard. But please correct me if she said something that I didn't hear. It's just weird. They're talking over each other. It's hard to hear. I doubt that this was someone that you personally know. Would that change your mind about what should happen to that person? About what should happen to that person? For prosecution purposes. Uh- So this is a question that detectives love to ask because what we know from just detectives asking these, the same questions so many times that people responsible for the crime will often 
give answers with lesser punishments. Like, I think they need help. That's what Marty Tankliff said when he was asked what should be done with the murders of Arlene and Seymour Tankliff. Other times they'll turn the other way. They'll be very aware why they're asking. The suspect will be very aware or the person being questioned will be very aware and say, and go balls, you know, balls out and say, you know, death penalty, death penalty all the way. Cause they know, because it is a measure what you, because if you're the person responsible, you of course want to be treated more gently Right, because you have already rationalized your reasons for doing it or have your own reasons. Um, no. <laughs> Is there any somebody, way that you would think somebody, somebody could... tried to kill my ex husband? They should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Regardless of who it is. I mean, it would be different if I thought it were my brother, but I don't think it was my family. Okay. Uh, anyone outside my immediate family, that's a tough one. Okay. But I don't think my immediate family did this. So okay. if it's anybody else, yeah. Would, would you think that this guy Charles- so she's saying that yeah well maybe here she's she's suggesting he could be a suspect but she has to know he's going to be a suspect anyway no it's a little under the bus but she's got I mean she could have really thrown him under the bus right he looked into hiring a hitman the Katie connection she could have thrown it all out there she could have given him the whole case but of course, it leads right back to her mom, too, and her, in my opinion, and Harvey, all of them. This is a family affair. Charlie, would he be capable of doing something like this? No. no. Let's just talk. He's a joker. Okay. All right. Based on the fact that the clock is already ticking, all right, and we have to do as much work as possible up front, that's why... I want you to stay here okay. if at all possible. Okay. But you're this ch- these children's mother, and if they just, have somebody, I can't freak them out. You know, like, nobody's gonna freak them out. I know. I'm just saying, like my kids, like they're already gonna have to deal with so much. Like they're gonna wonder where I am. Okay, I want I want to pick up my children, but don't freak them out after this. After their father has been brutally shot in the face and isn't going to survive, but don't freak them out at the police station. I mean, don't show them your, what, what does she think you're going to do? Show them their, their gun or something? What? This is so weird. This is her view of what a concerned mother does. And the best thing would be Lynn and Allen to have them hang around with them. Uh, my friend Janine, I was with two women. One of them is a, well, they're both doctors, but one of them um, has kids that the boys are friends with. And so, like, he could go over to their house. Um, they could go over to their house and spend time. I just don't, I don't want them, like, where's mommy? <laughs> Mommy's busy. On? Mommy busy can't come here right now. Will that suffice? For a little while, okay. yeah. All right. Lynn, do we have a number for She's like, you're ruining my excuse for getting out of here, is that I have to be with my children. You want me... Even though this isn't a school day and I've put them in daycare for the day when they could have been with their father or myself, you want me to reduce my time with them now? Now that I've already made the choice not to spend the day with them? I mean, it's like so crazy. Remember, this was, they were off of school. This is a summer. But look at look at the victim's advocate. She's back in the room and she's now, I mean, she's kind of like, you know, the body language is kind of interesting. She's trying to figure out how she can support Wendy. And it's all, of the, all about Wendy. So she's like, yeah, I can spend a little time, but then I have to go because I... <laughs> I can only be so helpful because I have to mother my kids, right? And they're like, what? For Lynn. Um, Joanna tried to get in contact with her, left a message at um, Alan's office for him to call. Yeah. They haven't heard back yet. Um, can they page him? Like, do they have a... Okay. Now, I know um, Jane's on the way here. Um, and you just don't think she... 
I mean, I, I think she'd be okay. I think I'd rather Jane. Jane has just never picked up my kids before. Would, okay. the, would the school have a problem with Jane picking them up? Given the circumstances, no. Okay. Well, I mean, do they do they have to have authorization? They probably do. They. I mean, I could call the school, and I mean, this is a very unusual circumstance. I could call the school and tell them I approve Jane McPherson to pick up the kids, and then does she have a place to take them? I mean, she has a nice house. Unusual. Who would use the word unusual? Unusual is like, I usually pick them up on a Tuesday, but I pick them up on a Thursday. This is horrifically life-altering alter, catastrophe, tragic event. Unusual. A you know, like she a child-friendly house. I'm just, I mean, I know she's on her way here She now, doesn't know so. what happened, I don't think. Okay. She just knows I'm here. Right. Uh, let's, uh, let's get... Jane's on her way here, all right, and the school's out on Tharp, and I'm assuming she lives up in the northeast part of town. Quite an assumption. Um, yeah, she's off Waverly, and her husband is a writer, so he, like the both parents are around. Okay. Let's um, have Jane, do you want me to talk to her or, or just tell her that uh, or, or have Joanna tell me, I'll talk to her. I think okay. someone should, Jane is, um, was a victim advocate too for a while. She's Jane, in there. Jane McPherson. McPherson. My was she a victim advocate? In Gadsden. Okay. Maybe she wasn't. She's a therapist. Okay. Um, Did she do something at the university now or she just a She was the one million bones woman. Okay. That's where I know her name right. from. Will you call, will you coordinate with her? Let her call the school to have Jane pick the children up. Okay. I'm going to redirect Jane to the school directly. Okay. It's the... It's what creative preschool, it's on Tharp, right past there's a Magnolia school, and then there's Creative on your right. It's right up here, right? It's on Tharp. Um, there's Tharp a couple. West, west of town? Mm, there's a couple. I'm really bad with directions. If you were to go all the way up Tennessee right. and turn right, like on, I think it's Ocala, right, right where Super Perros. Yeah, this is someone who sounds like they're really bad at giving directions, doesn't it? So she catches the anomaly there and then is of course giving her reason for it this is and, and then you'd make a left on tharp you'd go up a little ways more and it would be on your right creative free school i'm gonna throw up <laughs> come in the bathroom if you need to okay you want to go in for a bit no i'm fine okay well let me know if it uh... i'm just gonna Google it. That's okay. Creative preschool, yeah. Whoa. 1046 West Coast. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Uh huh. Do you want. It's like a whole cast of characters. You get Jane from One Million Bones. Were you involved in that? <laughs> Um, I knew about it. I know I saw a lot of stuff on it. Yeah. I can't recall if I've done anything directly with it. But... Do you want me to talk to them first, or do you want to? What would, would you tell them what happened, or no? No. Okay. Um, I will talk to them. Hi, Mr. Chuck. This is Wendy Ben and Lincoln's mom. Hi. Um, I'm not going to be able to pick them up today, but my friend Jane McPherson is going to come. Is that okay? Her name is Jane McPherson. She's a petite woman with short blonde hair. Yes. Um, she should have her idea if she's driving. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chuck. Are the boys doing okay? Okay. Well, that sounds great. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye. My kid's outside playing. Ben is in the blocks area playing with blocks. They're only a year and a half apart, so they'll be like a year behind something. each other every time in school, right? They have um, Ben's a July birthday. It begins October, so they made us up a little more space. Okay. In. So, like, have the. Yeah, because July he'll probably be the young baby in classes. So that was our, he'll be the older. 
that's what we were supposed to talk about this morning is like whether men should start kindergarten or go to kindergarten twice or what he should do. Um, and then he didn't call me back, which was weird. Um, Are you thirsty? Yeah. Let me see if I. Is it Joanne or Joanna? Joanna. She said she was going to bring some water. Okay. Yeah, it's really important to always remember everyone's name, isn't it, Wendy, when you want to impress them and win their influence? This is just wild. She's just running the show. She's having them waiting on her. Not only is she not a suspect, she's, you know, she's getting treated like a victim and a victim slash administrator. You know, she's just running everything. They're waiting on her, water, tissues. And she's deciding how long she's going to spend there. We'd really like you to hang around. Well, I can hang around a little bit, but I have to go mother my children. And she's saying Ben is outside. It's like almost like she's fantasizing about how she's going to have them under her control forever without Dan's influence forever now. It's like, it's like finally becoming real to her. She's like, they're playing outside. It's, it's so a little bit creepy to me. Hand that rocks the cradle-ish, except it's her own kids. We're kind of all running around. Let me, let me get that for you. Let me grab some more tissues, too. I've gone through. Oh, I want to be around you. <laughs> I just know if I was sitting here, Wendy would have said, what would I probably want? Not much, but I'll be right back, okay? Okay. Oh, Matt Winnicott, why do you, wait, Schneider, I'm sorry, Matt Schneider, I'm sorry. Why do you do these things? Why do you ask me these Sophie Choice questions? But thank you very much for the super chat. Um, Roberta, great show. I have a serious question. Okay. If you had to go on a business trip and sh there was no one to watch your cats other than Wendy or Amanda Knox, who would you choose to watch them? Thanks. Well, there was a story that came out about Amanda Knox adopting a dog from a shelter and returning the dogs. When the dog was returned, the shelter said that the dog's paws were all cut up. So now... I don't know if that was, I don't know how verified that story was, whether that was a rumor or not. But Wendy at least strives her for perfection. She cares so much about what others think about her that I would think that if she did something to my cats, she would be upset about it. No, I don't know. Oh, it's tricky. I would have to say Wendy, at least because she doesn't have that rumor attached to her or that story attached to her. But I remember when it came out, the people at the cl claiming to work at this shelter that she not only adopted a dog, she named it something really insensitive, but could not care for it and returned it in really disturbing shape. So yeah, I hate to say it, but I mean, really by a, by a hair, yeah, that you uh, you asked some tough questions. Those are some really Sophie Choice <laughs> type questions there, true crime questions. Ugh. They're all so disturbing. I mean, you know, it's all the same kind of personality. Totally self-absorbed, plays the victim, manipulates, cruel, psychopathic in my view. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that that's a toughie.
doing a little oh. crying for the camera here. Let me see if I can move forward. Wow, that's a long time they leave her alone. Interesting. Ellen is going to get Jane. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Investigator Isom. Isom, which is the man that's been talking yeah. to. He's going to grab her. Grab Jane. Um, yes, and Jane kind of voiced to Joanne. The kids probably wouldn't really necessarily recognize her. So, um, and in the meantime, Alan and Lynn got in touch with Joanna. So I think now what's happening is Joanna already called the preschool. Sorry, I know this is a lot of information taken, but I think Lynn's going to come here get car seats. The victim's advocate is apologizing to Wendy for giving her too much information at once. So she's totally on low status. Wendy is in control, high status. They are bringing her friends to her like, like a queen, like an offering. Go to preschool? She can't take the car because they're like examining the car. I think, or I don't, but essentially, yeah, they yes. They can take the car seats out. Their car's so dirty. It's covered, it's covered in Cheerios. And I actually <laughs> meant to make an appointment this week to get it clean, but I didn't get around to it. So. so let me tell you, my fan, I'm Wendy. Let me tell you something funny about me. My car seats are covered in Cheerios. Isn't that, isn't that adorable? Don't you love me even more? Don't you want to worship me even more? And look at all my important friends. Remember she was referencing friend's career and you're getting all of all the people that you go to the lectures of in this in it, coming to your workplace isn't it exciting for you we're also important and interesting um so they're going to take the car seats out of the car and put them in ellen think, and lynn's car and then they'll bring them ellen and lynn like the kids will be quite comfortable around them. right okay um and jane's right she hasn't so Jane's coming in here now? Yes. Does she know what's going on? They're going to be quite comfortable as they're going to be emotionally devastated. All right. As, uh, I think... Um, do Alden and Lynn know what's going on? I think they know that he's been seriously injured. I don't... Uh, sorry. Hi, Annie. Oh, dear. Oh. <laughs> I really needed some help. I just, I'm sorry. I needed to call you. Okay, sweetie. Did they tell you? Um, they didn't tell me. I have, I know. There's things on the news? There's, it is on the news, but I don't know anything. I know that, I know there was a shooting in Danny's block this morning. That's all I know. I don't know anything, just that Danny's been shot. Yeah, just what I heard on the news. So it appears, Lynn, you do know something. No. Oh, dear. Honey. Do you know how he is? He's not good, Jane. Really? I'm just driving up the street. And I saw like the tape and I just thought, oh, maybe there's like an electrical outage or something. Like I saw the street blocked. So you... I was driving into town. I was running errands. I was meeting some friends for lunch and I drove up Trescott because it's the shortcut. <laughs> and so I drive up Trescott and I see the tape. Because if I say it's the shortcut, it's the shortcut, right guys? I say it's a shortcut. It's my shortcut. No, doesn't everybody think that's a shortcut? The one with 1,500 speed bumps, I'm sorry, that's an exaggeration, has quite a few speed bumps and has been proved. Uh, check out Jibber's video or the Society Pages did a video with Jibber's video using it. You can map out the route. I think I've looked at, I, I've shown it on my channel, I believe. If I hadn't, if I haven't, I should. Excellent work, guys. It's not a shortcut in any way, but I love how she says it's like the shortcut. It's like, you know, 
She says it. It's it's a shortcut. And I was like, hmm, I guess there was like an electrical outage because sometimes we'd have trees that would fall or whatever. And so I turned around and didn't think anything of it. I was at lunch with two friends and the officer shows up. And I've been here since then. And you don't have a phone? Well, I had a phone. I told, I gave them, I said, you can search my phone because maybe they can like find something useful on it. We have to go through a lot of these steps and that's of course, to explain of course. to her. It's just as much effort to go through the steps to exclude anybody that could possibly be involved. Well, of course. Yeah. yeah. I mean, is this a scene from a play? Does this not look like this was staged by a director? We have Lynn on her, literally on her knees in front of Wendy. Literally, like, <laughs> on her knees in front of Wendy. Like, Wendy is the queen. Everyone, how can we help you? And they took away your phone? You mean you've been sitting in this room? without a phone and having to help out solving the murder of the father of your children. Oh, poor Wendy. Oh, Wendy. So she knows she knew the right people to call the right people will see her in a victim's light. How did anyone exist without their phone before cell phones were invented? We used to just have to sit in rooms without any phone. It was, it was really a tough times guys. So we have her phone as soon as it's apparently it's taking a little bit longer than normal. And as soon as uh, we get done with the phone, she'll, she'll get it back. So we're just, but the main thing I was concerned about is the kids need to be picked up oh, on exactly. Friday. Right. right. And so when I came and they said they'd spoken to the Grossman, yeah. I was like, I'll get the kids. I'm a right. social worker. I've, I've picked up kids that don't know me before, but right. I think I especially said, given this. They gave them your name and Lynn's right. name said, I don't know how good that sounds, Lynn. I picked up kids who don't know me before. <laughs> I just kidding. Yeah, this. Oh boy. I think like Alan and Lynn have done it. Like when Danny had his back surgery, Alan and Lynn did it before. So because I was out right. of town, and so they like, have, right, right. they've they done have. it before. They've got four kids, so they can. Um... I have. Um, are you gonna be here for a while? You want me to sit down? So, like, I might have a blanket in my car or something. We uh, do we have anything do you have here, or have they all been used? Somebody who could get Let me check. This one is one freezing. And I apologize. I thought about that when she was shivering earlier, but I even Wendy thinks it's ridiculous. She's like, "Did you just see that sarcastic little laugh she made?" Wait, hold on. Let me see if I can find it. One second. They're like, "Get her a blanket," and she's like. <laughs> It's almost like a little duper's delight. Like you're buying this, this stuff. You're buying my, my, my ridiculous acting, really. And isn't it interesting? Someone left a comment, which I thought was insightful. How Wendy can't be that smart to date Jeffrey Lacoste because he figured it all out shortly after the crime. Meaning, why date a social worker? But she seems to, here we have Jane, who used to be a social worker. I don't know if she still is, but she's being brought on the scene. That's the person, Wendy. So she wants to surround herself with social workers, I would think, because they are bleeding hearts. That's the way Jeffrey Lacoste describes himself, a very Mr. Rogers kind of guy. And that they will treat her and perceive her as a victim. We um, do we have anything do you have here, or have they all been used? Let me check. This one is one freezing. And I apologize. I thought about that when she was shivering earlier, but I guess got a lot of. Stuff. Did you guys catch that second time around? <laughs> the little. It's almost like a dog when you blow into their ears, like, <laughs> you know. No, there's, clearly there's it's a, not there's really a, the most important it is a, thing it's right not now. the most important thing. No, 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 I, was, I, was, I saw her shivering and I kept thinking I'll go out yeah. and find out if there's, they had a bunch <laughs> of them, they had a bunch of them, but I don't know what's still available. So what do you mean he's not good? What do you mean about this? I don't think he's going to make it. Oh my God. <laughs> Let's put that on. That would be great. Thank 
Thank you. I really don't think that you know that. Now I'm thinking of James Brown when they put the cape around him at the end of the show. He comes back. I mean, <laughs> what is going on here? I am running out of gas, guys. This is my second show for today. But I will pick this up tomorrow. We're, we're going to continue to look at this because this is just one of the most incredible pieces of footage in, in true crime history, I'd say. Not because it's so explosive or because it's so emblematic and telling of the whole story and the personalities involved and the rich psychological layers in this case. So thank you so much for listening. And please, if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the thumbs up subscribe to the episode. Please leave me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and I will see you back here again really soon. Have a great night, everybody.